<clears throat> yes, 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 again. Am I as, as I am, as you are? Today, I basically just want to touch upon the understanding of God. <laughs> yes, God. G O D. What is this G O D? Where is this G O D? Who is this G-O-D? I felt it was um, kind of relevant to touch upon this at this moment because I had a conversation earlier with somebody, uh, somebody I know about this uh, very topic. So I said, you know what? I'll touch upon it. Let me touch upon it today sometime today. And so, here we are. Of course, you know the regular procedure of how we do things. So let's just dive right into it, <clears throat> shall we? Okay. Um, of course, you know the process. We'll go line for line. What I say, doorway after doorway for doorway for doorway doorway after doorway and we'll open it up from that point on okay so let's go into it the first line is the first doorway is what we call God is a point of focus well, what do you mean? Well, it's somewhere that we direct or focus our attention to during certain times in our life. I guess you can call the weakest times of our life. Or the most strenuous times of our life. Or the most, or the most life taxing or energy draining times of our life. Just to make a little understanding about it. It's basically just a point of focus that we focus on a point. We focus on a point and we call upon. So once we focus on a point, we create that point. That point becomes a live thing. And then we pull and draw from it what we choose to or desire to or what we need or want from whatever we're requesting from it. But what is it that, we're, that we are requesting or desiring or needing from? What is this point of focus that we are focusing on at whatever time in our life? And whatever's going on within that time that brings us to that point or that need of a point to focus on with a directing or a direction of our attention to it for some reason. There has to be something more grand than us. There has to be something more greater than me. Really? Is there? Let's take a little further. The next line is, or the next doorway is, a focused point of attention. So once we create a point of focus that we focus on, Whatever we focus on, whatever angle we focus on, then it becomes a focused point.
point of attention, of our attention. So as we focus somewhere at this point within our mind, wherever this point may be, wherever this point may be, as we point, we give it a life and it becomes alive. And then as it becomes alive, we pull from it whatever we desire, need, want, or request from it. But you see, once you understand metaphysics, attention is life. Which is why I say some babies that come into this life form in the cradle or in the crib, some babies die. Why? From lack of attention to them, towards them. So in metaphysics or metaphysical psychology, we learn that attention towards a point of focus is life. But once we don't give that attention to it, that life that came into a live form dies. We redirect our attention here. And it's calling for attention. We redirect our attention here. And it's calling for attention. If we don't give our attention or acknowledgement to this point of focus or this life form that we have created, it dies. So whatever we give our attention to, we give life to. But it doesn't mean that a life was there to begin with. Pertaining to the concept today, which is what we call G-O-D, or what you call God, which is Gad, derived from the word Gad, G-A-D, which is a German word. But let's not go too deep into the language arts aspect of it or the history aspects of it. Let's keep it kind of ingrained within the focus of principle, which is where I always touch upon certain surfaces of understanding. Okay, so let's take it further, shall we? So just understand that whatever your point, a focus point of attention that you focus your point of attention to, you're giving life to. But understand that it doesn't mean that life was there to begin with, you created the life. Just understand that before we go further, okay? Let's go on to the next thing. Oh, cranberry juice, of course. The next line is, the next doorway is, most people, most individuals, most minds look at this thing called God as a genie of some sort. <laughs> Um, what I mean by genie is, God, give me this. God, give me that. Grant me this. I need this. I need that. Please. I wish. I hope. I need. I'm asking. I'm begging. So some people look at this point a, f a point of focus and this focus point of attention as a kind of genie, like a genie, make your wish happen. So we create this focus point and then we direct our attention to this focus point and then we create whatever we want it to be. Now it's our own personal genie. Some people's, what they call their God is their own personal genie. And if you look at the word genie, once you break it down in the understanding of language arts, the word genie is connected, is the same word as actually the word gene. 
which is the word genetics. Genetics is the same word as genius. Your own genius. You're tapping into your own genius. And you don't even know. And you don't even know what you're doing. Your genie, what you call your gene E, is your gene E. Your gene or your genes. Your genes is your genetics. Your genetics is your own genius. So you don't even know that you're tapping into yourself and asking yourself for what yourself wants. So why redirect or direct your attention and point of focus elsewhere when all you got to do is make a long story short, cut all the middlemen out, cut all the liaisons out and get straight to the damn point. Which is you. So are you calling upon a God? Or are you calling upon yourself? Remember, you are a God. Or a form of God. In metaphysics also we learned. That that which projects from that is that. The projection is nothing different from that which projects. These are certain kind of understandings that I've learned in metaphysical psychology. Some you may want to take with you. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. Whatever. Throw in the garbage. Take it with you. Put it in your pocket. Who gives a damn? Let's move on to the next one. The next line is, or the next doorway is, God, a kind of unsure security or Secure unsurety, a kind of unsure security or secure unsurety. What do you mean by that? Because whatever you're calling upon and giving your attention to and, and pointing your point of focus at and into, in your mind, you know, you think it's real. You think it's real, might be real. You think it might be real. You're not sure if it's real. You feel like it's real, but you're not sure. You want it to be real. A wanting to think that you're being heard. It's a wanting to think, I, I want to think that I'm being heard. When you speak out loud towards your point of attention or your, or your focusing point of attention. I want to feel as if I'm being heard when I speak. I'm just, I just want to feel like I'm being heard or I'm being seen when I speak and I animate towards this, towards this mental point of focus, which I call God. But... According to metaphysics and my understanding of my calling and my path, it's actually you that you're actually secure by, and it's actually you that you are actually unsure about. Because you are a God, and God will always remain unsure about itself. Well, what do you mean by this, Blue? Explain this, Amias. To make a short story long, what we call G-O-D, at some point of its existence, a, what we know, or what we may call a contract or identify, as a contract was created by itself. And it said the contract was basically known as I will forever remain lost within myself as myself. This is what the energy or the point of focus or the point of attention called G-O-D contracted with itself, within itself, as itself. And Within that contract, it said, 
the only ties I will have to myself to remain as I to remain as myself will be these principles consciousness awareness knowing consciousness awareness knowing other than that I'm going to always doubt myself but these three strings will keep me tied to myself even though I remain lost within myself it had to have a connection to itself at the same time it disconnected from itself we are that thing we are it it is us so your awareness your consciousness your knowing or knowing of self is its strings tied to itself from itself as itself to remain lost within itself for all eternity so these three strings bring about doubt curiosity questioning of itself as itself within itself by itself this I say that to say this is that this is why I said what we call G-O-D is a kind of unsure security or secure unsurety you don't know what to call it you can't pinpoint it because it can't pinpoint itself it doesn't know what to call itself because it can only be itself there is nothing outside of itself or beyond itself it cannot fathom itself. This is why you cannot fathom certain things in this reality. You cannot fathom G.O.D. You feel it, you know it, you know it's real, but you're unsure still. You doubt it, you question it. You don't know, but you do know. You cannot identify or describe what you feel. It's something which doesn't have a word, doesn't have a form, it doesn't have a body. Its primordial existence is not within physical form or third density or what you know as third dimension. It's a part of it. It's a reflection of it in a different reality of itself. As itself and within itself. There is nothing outside of it. There is nothing outside of you. So are you calling upon G-O-D or God? Or are you calling upon yourself? Or is it calling upon itself through the medium or the conduit of you? Because you are it and it is you. Or am I just speaking crazy? So the poem makes sense to you. What is your calling about? So let's move on to the next line or the next doorway. I'm having fun so far. Okay. The next doorway is <clears throat> this thing you call G-O-D can be a figment of your imagination. But what do you mean by that? Imagination itself is just another opportunity to create something in the boundless fields of mind, not brain, because brain is bound as a muscle, a muscle within the skull, a skull surrounded by skin. Not, not this, not what's in here. Now what's on the inside? This is bound by something. Mind is boundless. So what you call G-O-D just may be a figment of your imagination. And if you're a scientist or scientific minded, you know as a scientist that you have to factor in other possibilities, especially if it makes sense to you. 
especially if you connect with it or relate with it to some degree, whether you know why you relate with it and connect with it or not. You cannot cancel something out. You have to factor it in until you play with the formula and see if some result actually comes about. If you're a scientist, if you're science-minded or scientific, or you think scientifically. So, what you call G-O-D just may be a figment of your imagination. Maybe. Possibly. Probably. Might be. Who knows? Possibility. Right? Wrong? Only you know. At the same time, you don't know. <laughs> but that's the whole journey. That's the whole mission. That's the whole adventure. That's the whole challenge of this reality. It's here to challenge itself. But let's not get too uh, technical with that. Let's remain simple at the same time subtle okay so let's dive into the next line or the next doorway what you call god is just a direction of mind you have a mind you direct it you are the director you give it a direction you can take it from direction from that direction and redirect it elsewhere don't you think of certain thoughts you like, I don't want to think about that, I don't want to think about that. And you redirect your thought to be somewhere else so that you can be in a certain kind of different feeling and emotion, a different body. To operate and function a different way in your area or atmosphere or environment for whatever reason. To keep yourself balanced in the state of imbalance. All right, so... It may just be a direction of mind, something and somewhere to point and create for whatever reason you choose to create and point and focus and create something for. Maybe, possibly, probably, it's a possibility that might be what it is. Just playing with certain principles, certain things that you may want to ponder and let your mind wander if it chooses to okay don't fight it don't fight the power okay um the next line is something this thing we call god something which appears or arrives at the bottomless at the bottom pit of your hope your faith your helplessness, your desperation, your starvation, your need, your survival. Etc. 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 So basically, what I'm saying is this thing appears or arrives at the very dead end of something involved within your human nature or human survival. It's sort of like the very last hope. This is how some people treat this energy or point of focus or point of attention called G-O-D. It arrives, something which appears or arrives at the bottom pit of your hope, your faith, your helplessness, your desperation, your depression, your starvation, your need, and your survival. This is when this thing appears and arrives. Oh God, please help me. God, please, I'm starving. Oh God, please, I need your help. Please, God, oh God. God, help me. God, give me the strength. It appears at the very end of your human activity and your human nature or your human desperation, which means that it's at the end, at the very tip or the very end of your humanity, which means that it's something beyond your human nature, 
which is the other aspect of who and what you are when it comes to a spiritual understanding of things. This is the formless aspect of what you truly are, which is your own genius. There was something on the metaphysics where they said, spirituality begins at the end of science, or where science ends, spirituality begins. Now understand even the word science is related to the word seance, which is also a cousin to the word of ritual which is actually connected to ceremony. Do your homework on language arts. And language arts are words that are spelled or sound like another word or a twin of that word or related or connected automatically, instantly, undoubtedly. Okay? Something to think about. Okay, so when all human nature fails within you, you call upon your spiritual aspect of self. Possible, right? Right, okay, let's move on to the next line. We, appear with our own unknown, unnamed deity or genie, if you want to put it in those understanding or that concept. Of course, you know your own genie is your own gene, your own genetics, your own genius. The genius that you don't tap into until the very end point or dead end of what you are experiencing within that moment. So in other words, when you can't manifest no more, you, or you reach a point where you can't manifest what you want, what you want to create in the physical aspect or the third dimensional understanding or the third density reality, what you do is you call upon your own genius, which is actually in another world, another way of understanding, your own personal manifester. So you're calling upon your own God-given divine manifester through your own primordial, primordial natural birthright as a being that is having an experience within the existence of itself. And this true existence is where the manifester or where the spirit or where the soul resides. So when the experience fails you, you call upon your existence. The existence made you appear. So when you don't know how to utilize or no longer know how to utilize the devices of your experience, you call upon the divine inherited powers of your existence to manifest something because your existence manifested you to have an experience. So when the experience being, which is you in the physical form, can't manifest things or have trouble or have difficulty manifesting things for you in the third density, you call upon that which is beyond third density, that which created third density, that which gave birth to third density, that which appeared third density, that which is the phenomenon behind the experience of third density to manifest something for you. So in other words, once again, you're actually just calling upon yourself. 
know thyself. Do you know yourself? Don't answer me now. There is no answer, as a matter of fact. There's only truth. What truth? Your truth. That's it. There's no the truth. There's only your truth. Your calling. What are you? Who are you? What the hell you came here for? What is your mission? What is your path about? Figure that out. Okay? So, let's move on to the next line. There's only two more lines left. Next line is, are you using this energy called G-O-D as a point of reference as your own wish master or as a form of hope? Using as a point of reference, then that's okay, I guess. Because you're actually referring back to the self, which is actually you. You are your own reference. You are your own validation. You are your own confirmation. You confirm yourself. You validate yourself. You give reference to yourself. So you're actually coming back to a receding point, which is actually where you begin. Or where your true primordial nature resides at. It's fine. Are you using this as are you using this point of reference called G-O-D as your own wish master? Like I love Genie. <laughs> Listen. Then your wish comes about. Check out that movie that movie Wishmaster. It's a horror movie. It came out in the 80s. That's one of my favorite joints too. Um, it's one of the classics, one of the horror classics. And I've seen all horror movies, all horror classics, because it actually dives deep within the darkness of which you truly are. There's nothing wrong, bad, evil about it. It's a more deep understanding of what self is, or the other side of yourself is, or the other side of itself is. The it, which is the I. The I, which is the it. Which is the you or the me that you think that you are. In the mirror. That image, that fake image that you see, this fake image that you see right now on the screen. I'm hidden in plain sight. I'm in plain sight in front of you, but I'm hidden behind this plain sight. This is not who cool and what I truly am. I just need this physical body to animate to you, to get a message through me to you. So I'm using this vehicle as a conduit or a medium or a middle or a liaison to convey a message to you. And through you, as me, but as you, at the same time, it's a reflection of me. Just so you're just a projection of me, and you are just a reflection of me. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to play too much, but whatever. I just want to say that. Or using it, or using this as a, or using this G-O-D as a form of hope. I mean, whatever you're using it for, whether you're using it as a point of reference, as your own wish master, as your own hope, point of focus and point of attention to hope and pull from it, whatever it may be, just understand and understand that it is you that you are pulling from. You can only pull from you. It can only pull from it. There is nothing outside of it to pull from or to call upon. It can only pull from itself. It can only call upon itself. It has everything that it needs. Get it? Maybe you don't. Maybe you do. It's up to you. Okay. Um, the next line is, According to occult wisdom and occult understanding and metaphysical wisdom, metaphysical understanding of self, these letters, these three letters, G, O, D, stand for something in a spiritual aspect and in a physical aspect. In the physical aspect, G, O, D is also related to G, O, V. 
subliminally talking to you. And in GOV, it means government or government ordinances department. Government ordinance department. In the spiritual aspect, it means generator, operator, destroyer. So why would I break down G-O-D? Understand that what I just said is neither negative nor positive. It's neither bad nor good. It's neither pure nor evil. It depends upon your understanding of what I'm actually touching upon and what it actually means to you. Okay? On one side, the physical understanding, dealing with the G-O-V. G-O-D means government ordinance department. On the spiritual aspect, it means governor, I mean, pardon me, generator, operator, destroyer. Um, the reason why I broke down G, the letter G, and the letter O, and the letter D was for this simple reason. Words are composed of letters. Letters, what you call letters, are actually symbols. Symbols are actually just shapes and signs. Like the letter O can be related to the pupil or the sun or the moon. The letter L can be symbolic of right angles or an angle, which can also uh, related to an acute angle. Now you have letters that look like certain things, like M and W. It looks like a wave or frequency. So we know that, or oh, the letter A looks like a pyramid. C looks like an eclipse. D the capital letter D looks like an eclipse moon. And so on and so on and so on. You even have the, the capital letter H. You turn it sideways, it looks like the capital letter I. So we know that words are composed of letters. Letters are actually symbols and signs, right? And what do they do with the word? They say in spelling bees, they say spell the word. What do you think a spell is? Why do you think they use words in rituals or ceremonies or seances? You're spelling a word. You're talking and speaking words. But you have to know how to spell the word or put the word in a spell. You're a magician, which is why you call upon your own genie and your own G-O-D. You're using your own magic and you don't even know what you're doing. Okay, so let's go back to what I was saying. Words are, comp words are composed of letters. Letters are actually symbols. Symbols are actually shapes and signs. Like the letter O is a circle. Like the letter A, capital A is a triangle. These are shapes and signs, which can actually be related when you deal with ritualistic concepts, sigils. And that's using certain forms of black magic and white magic and certain kind of things dealing with that, you know, according to the nature of those uh, workings. But I don't want to get too deep or too overt, too far from the subject. Let's just stay where we're at at the moment. And um, so in other words, maybe the word itself just represents initials, G-O-D. Maybe it's just an initial. Maybe that G and that O. And that D, maybe it's just initials. And if it's just initials, then these three letters have to be separated. 
G has to be here, O has to be here, and D has to be here. And you see these things as three different shapes, signs, and symbols. Maybe. So, um, in May, this word that we're spelling with these letters just may actually, may actually be just representing initials. And initials is also related to the word initiate. What are you initiating? What are you conjuring? What are you invoking? Just a question and an answer. Um, so maybe it just represents initials. Maybe. And even if you look at it, um, these letters come from what we know as an alphabet, right? What is alphabet? Alphabet is alpha, beta. Alphabet is alpha, beta. Alpha is a certain kind of mind. Beta is another kind of way of mind. You got alpha, beta, theta, delta, and gamma. You have five brain waves or five waves of the mind, five frequencies, five frequencies of the brain waves of the mind. Alpha, beta, theta, delta, and gamma. So alpha, beta together are alphabet, which is where you get the word alphabet. It's all dealing with mind. And mind, once you understand mind, mind thinks in symbols, signs, shapes, and colors. And repetition. This is how the subconscious mind is created which is the mind, the first mind that was created when you were an infant, a baby, a kid, and a child. This is when this first starts to form, which is who and what you are today, which has an effect on who and what you are today. The same way you learn to brush your teeth and comb your hair when you were young is the same way you brush your teeth and comb your hair today, every morning before you go to work or school, before you step out into society. It's the same damn thing you do. You still hear your mother's voice in your head, your father's voice in your head. And this is just how it rolls. This is just how the mind operates. Okay? Um, this is how it primarily thinks. Your mind is a simple thing, so it thinks on a very simple level. There's nothing complicated about it. The brain is complicated. The mind is simple. It's a very simple apparatus, a very simple uh, thing. Okay? We all operate and function subconsciously. Colors, signs, symbols, shapes, and repetition, or that which is consistent, or that which is frequent. This is how the subconscious mind operates, okay? And um, last but not least, um, when you're worshiping this energy called G-O-D, and you're like this, and you're like this, please, God. Help me, God. I beg of you, God. God, give me the strength. When you're looking up, understand that I don't care whether you're grimy, whether you're sneaky, whether you're a liar, whether you're honest. Whatever you may be, you're operating from here, the heart, which is why we're so involved and engulfed in this L-O-V-E thing. And while we're always seeking L-O-V-E and why L-O-V-E-E, -E, L-O-V-E plays such a major impact on our being. But it just means truth or what I learned from the occultist initials B-H. I don't want to get into him too much, into this entity, but it said L-O-V-E is basically being true to something and cutting through to its essence. Essence is something that goes beyond presence. Essence gives validation to the presence. The present is you. 
a physical thing, a physical being. But before you, which is beyond you, is the essence of you, the invisible aspect of that which is physical. So it's L-O-V-E, an ancient understanding or our ancestors' understanding was being true to something and cutting through that something to its essence. So you can be true to be grimy, you can be true to be a liar, be true to be honest, be true to be loving, whatever you want to be, but you're true to it. You're true to murdering. You're true to being a addict. You're true to drugs. You're true to relationships. You're true to your job. You're true to going to school and being a classmate. You're true to eating junk. You're true to killing yourself. You're true to your health. Whatever it, whatever it is that you're involved in, you're true to it, which means that you're here. So when you're worshiping something up there, God, 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 G-O-D, 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 please, 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 I beg of, I beg of you, I beg of you, whatever you are doing, you're actually here. And you're worshiping this. So what I want to say is, when you're when you think you're worshiping something up there, that's equivalent to the heart looking up to the brain. So that last line I want to touch upon was the heart worshiping the brain. If the heart only knows that everything it needs is within itself, there is no looking up. Or worshiping the brain. The heart will remain where it's at and the brain will remain where it's at. So when you're looking at worshiping something, asking upon something, begging something, pleading with something, that's equivalent to the heart worshiping the brain. The thought, the brain is only true to the thoughts and the experience and what it's seen and what it's sensed and what it touched and made contact with, which is a part of this physical reality, this third dimensional illusion. The heart is remaining true, staying on the path, staying focused, not involved with the brain. Anything that the heart is in, the brain tries to involve itself in, but that's not what it's about. The brain needs to know when to mind its business. The heart is something different. So what are you looking up to? What are you worshiping? What are you begging? What are you pleading with? When everything that you need is right here. Everything that you are is right here. Self-realization. Know thy self. My asasium, and my as, as I am, as you are, one, zero. <laughs>